Hello everyone. In the following poetry lesson, I will be going through an analysis of William Blake's poem, The Garden of Love. The following is some background information to William Blake. Remember that this would not be examinable, but knowing a bit about William Blake's background can help us place this poem in context. William Blake was an English poet, painter and printmaker or illustrator. His radical or revolutionary ideas about society, politics, marriage and sexuality were far ahead of his time. He lived through the second half of the 1700s and the first two decades of the 1800s. This was a time of the Industrial Revolution when there was major political and social upheaval and disorder in Britain. Blake was fiercely opposed to social injustices during his time, particularly injustices like slavery, poverty and the exploitation of children. Although Blake was a spiritual person, he was against the church and organized religion. He is considered an important and influential figure in the world of English literature. Blake is considered a romantic poet. This is because of his belief that nature represented what was pure and ideal about the world. This is a notion that is evident in this poem, The Garden of Love. Let us read through the poem. At this stage, I would like you to try and see if you are able to gather any meaning, if you notice any figures of speech, or if anything resonates with you. The poem reads, I went to the garden of love and saw what I never had seen. A chapel was built in the midst where I used to play on the green. And the gates of this chapel were shut, and thou shalt not writ over the door. So I turned to the garden of love that so many sweet flowers bore, and I saw it was filled with graves and tombstones where flowers should be, and priests in black gowns were walking their rounds and binding with briars my joys and desires. Let us take a look at a brief summary of what this poem is about. This poem is a recollection of when the speaker visits a garden or park in which he used to play. He finds that a church has been built there and that graves and tombstones have replaced the lovely flowers he remembers from when he was a child. The speaker describes how he sees priests wearing black gowns walking about and how the doors of the church are closed. We learn that all the joy, freedom and pleasure that the speaker associated with the garden has been destroyed and replaced with images of repression, gloom and death. In the next few slides, we will be taking a close look at each line of this poem. The first two lines of the poem read, I went to the garden of love and saw what I never had seen. Let us consider the phrase garden of love here in line 1. A question we can ask ourselves is why has this phrase been written using capital letters? We can say that the name of the garden, the garden of love, is a proper noun because it is the name given to a specific special place. Considering one of the themes of this poem is religion, what biblical reference could we say we have here? I have placed the figure of speech, allusion, in brackets, because remember, allusion in literature and poetry is when there is an indirect reference to something else in a piece of literature. We can say that the allusion here is to the Garden of Eden in which Adam and Eve were able to live with love and freedom until they disobeyed God's instructions and were then burdened with shame. However, in this poem, the Garden of Love represents innocence and a sense of natural joyfulness. 
Let us consider the colon that has been placed at the end of line 2. We could say that the use of the colon adds emphasis to the content and it creates a sense of anticipation for the information that is to follow. Lines 3 and 4 read, A chapel was built in the midst where I used to play on the green. Take a look at the word chapel. Notice that it has been written with a capital letter. We can thus say that the word chapel is a representation of Christianity and the church. The next phrase to consider here is the green. Here the green refers to an open area of grass or a kind of park in the middle of a village or small town where everyone could socialize and children could play. A village green or a park is a place we can associate with relaxation and happiness. When I picture this in my mind, I see people enjoying picnics and children happily running about. The green, if we liken it to a park, is a communal or shared space that is not owned by an individual or an organization. It is not private property. If we have this notion in mind, what does the green then symbolize? We can say that the green is a symbol of freedom from authority and control. Lines 5 and 6 of the Garden of Love read, And the gates of this chapel were shut, and thou shalt not writ over the door. If we consider the word shut, what does it suggest about the church if its gates are closed? We could say that the church is not a welcoming, compassionate institution. If the gates were open, it could possibly mean that anyone is welcome and free to come inside, but this is not the case. And written on the church door are the words, Thou shalt not. The question here is, what is this allusion to? In line with allusion to Christianity, we can say that thou shalt not is a reference to the Ten Commandments. What does this phrase thou shalt not suggest about the church? The commentary here could be that this phrase emphasizes that the church is only concerned with forbidding things and punishing sins. Let us consider the use of the full stop that has been placed after the phrase thou shalt not. What function does this full stop have? It can be said that the full stop emphasizes the command thou shalt not and makes it sound more forceful and authoritative. Lines 7 and 8 of this poem read, So I turn to the garden of love, that so many sweet flowers bore. What I want you to picture in your minds at this stage is the speaker arriving at the place where the green used to be, and instead of the open green grass in front of him, he sees a church that has its doors shut. He then remembers a flower garden that used to be within the green or the park, and he turns to see if that garden he remembers is still there. Flowers are beautiful things, and thus the sweet flowers could symbolize the happy freedom of the speaker's youth, which was unburdened by restrictions and shame. The speaker finds that the green and the flower garden have all gone, the green replaced with a chapel and the flower garden replaced with tombstones or graves. Lines 9 and 10 of this poem read, And I saw it was filled with graves and tombstones where flowers should be. In other words, the space where flowers once were is now filled with graves and tombstones. Consider the words graves and tombstones. It says there in the block that the graves and the tombstones have replaced the flowers. What kind of image does this create? We can say that this creates quite an ominous, dark and sinister image. 
The positivity that was once associated with the open field and the flowers no longer exists. The last two lines of this poem read, And priests in black gowns were walking their rounds, and binding with briars my joys and desires. Let us take a look at these particular words and phrases. Priests in black gowns, walking their rounds, and binding with briars my joys and desires. Is this a positive image? We can answer, no, it isn't. My question to you is, what kind of people would be responsible for walking their rounds and restricting people from their freedom? Does it not remind you of prison wardens in a prison? This is quite an ominous image, because the priests in their black gowns seem a little threatening, like the enforcers of the church's law. Like prison wardens, they patrol the garden by walking their rounds and binding or controlling people's natural impulses and desires. However, what could also be a perfectly normal and acceptable situation where priests are perhaps merely saying prayers within the chapel grounds, here is given a sinister and intimidating connotation. Let us consider the words binding and briars in isolation. Briars refers to branches with thorns on them. The word binding means restricting or to chain something so it cannot move. In simple terms, the speaker is saying here that the priests who walk about the chapel grounds enforcing the church's laws painfully restrict his joys and natural human desires. Now that we have completed a line-by-line -line analysis of this poem, let us have a look at the form and structure. If you have a look at the poem as a whole, you would notice that it has three stanzas. And each stanza has four lines. The stanzas are used to focus our attention on different issues. Stanza 1 deals with the speaker's discovery of the chapel that has been built on the green or the field where he used to play as a young child. Stanza 2 reveals the speaker's feelings about the chapel, but he expresses hope for comfort to be found in the garden to which he hopes is still there. Stanza 3 describes the disappointment that the garden too has undergone major change and how he feels that his joys and desires are restricted. Let us have a look at the rhyme scheme in this poem. In the first two stanzas, the last words of the second and fourth lines rhyme with each other. In stanza 1, the words seen and green rhyme. Words that rhyme and that are found at the end of a line of poetry is what we call end rhyme. The rhyme scheme that is created here in stanza 1 is A, B, C, B. In stanza 2, the words door and bore rhyme. This is also an example of end rhyme, and in this stanza, the rhyme scheme is D-E-F-E. -E. In stanza 3, the words at the end of the line do not rhyme. However, the poet uses internal rhyme with gowns and rounds in line 11, and briars and desires in line 12. When words rhyme within the lines of poetry and not at the end, we call this internal rhyme. Let us consider the rhythm of this poem. The rhythm in the poem is mostly regular due to the steady meter and rhyming. However, the change in rhyme and pace in the final two lines draws the reader's attention. Perhaps the speaker suggests that his world is now out of balance with his realization and this new reality requires a different form of expression. This poem could be interpreted in different ways. 
Firstly, it could simply be a mark of the passage of time. In other words, towns and cities change, buildings are built and others are demolished. It is simply as a result of human expansion that an open area of the speaker's childhood no longer exists. Secondly, though, this poem could be interpreted in a less literal way in that the fact it is a religious building that has taken over the piece of land or the green. It could suggest a wider commentary on organized religion and its influence on people's innocent pleasures and freedom. So because of the rules religion prescribes, some could argue that organized religion is merely a means to control people. This is definitely something debatable, so what would your opinion on this be? The diction in a poem refers to the speaker's choice of words. In this poem, The Garden of Love, the diction is simple and straightforward. There are no elaborate uses of language or complex figures of speech. The effect of this is that it captures the natural expression of the speaker's experience. The speaker merely tells us what he is observing in that moment. It could be said that the use of innuendo is evident. Remember that innuendo is a remark, often one that is disrespectful, made in the form of an insinuation. In other words, an indirect statement with an underlying meaning. We can say that the use of innuendo is evident as the speaker does not express his anger or disappointment explicitly or openly, but that his feelings are implied in the phrases where the flowers should be and binding with briars his joys and desires. Notice how the speaker uses repetition of the word and throughout the poem. This simply emphasizes how he notices one unpleasant change after another. Also regarding the diction of this poem, there is a strong contrast between the words the speaker uses to describe the garden he remembers and the words he uses to describe what he sees now. The contrasting words and images include green versus black, so the green of the field versus the black of the priest's gowns, the flowers versus the graves or tombstones, beauty and joy versus something ominous and depressing, flowers versus briars, flowers that represent joy and freedom versus briars which are branches with thorns on them representing restriction and control. The image of playing freely versus the priest doing their rounds. Again, the representation of freedom versus being controlled. Nature versus man-made objects. Perhaps some could argue that this is a commentary on the freedom of nature versus the restrictions and control of organized religion. There are contrasting images of light versus dark, life versus death, and lastly, freedom versus restriction. For the last part of this analysis, let us consider the tone and mood of this poem. Remember that tone refers to the feelings and the attitude of the speaker in the poem. This is often conveyed through language and diction. In the first two stanzas, we could say that the tone is almost dreamlike, as if the speaker is in a state of reverie or like a daydream as he observes the changes he has discovered. The tone in the third stanza is almost indignant or resentful and filled with a feeling of scorn or criticism for what the speaker has observed. Remember that mood refers to the feelings of the reader. In other words, when we read the poem, what kind of feelings are elicited or felt within us as the audience? 
The contrast between things like the flowers and the tombstones creates a mood of almost horror and a sense of uneasiness as the speaker realizes how the joyful place of his memory has been transformed into a place of death and oppression. Thank you for viewing this presentation on William Blake's poem, The Garden of Love. Please be sure to subscribe to my channel for more presentations on poetry, literature, language and creative writing for English home language and English first additional language for grades 8 to 12.